this is, this is silly. <laughs> Welcome back to my channel and you join me on a sunny March morning in the Suffolk town of Sudbury sitting in this uh, delightful little garden next to a statue of a dog. The breed of dog is actually a Talbot and today I'm going to take a walk around the town following the Talbot Trail. Now I've been into the tourist information centre and picked up this leaflet and throughout the town are 14 red bollards and they correspond to the, um, in the um, descriptions in the booklet and I'm going to walk around the town and discover all the location of all 14 and then read out the information that's printed in this booklet and, uh, and see what it says and along the way we'll discover a few added extra um, historical facts about Sudbury, including tales of execution and a musical vicar. Now the Talbot is a breed of dog believed to have uh, come from France or Belgium and it's now extinct. The, uh, the modern day equivalent or the, um, the bloodline are actually bloodhounds or um, uh, beagles. I think they're the, the closest modern day uh, dog to uh, to the um, to the Talbot, and the Talbot dog also features on Sudbury's coat of arms, which is uh, which is rather interesting. So hence the the Talbot dog and uh, the Talbot trail. Remember Talbot being a, a make manufacturer of car. I once drove a, a Talbot Sunbeam. Beginning to wish I hadn't. It wasn't a very good car. But let's head up. Now into the town centre and discover the location of the first of these red bollards on the Talbot Trail. Now the first red post is outside the Visitor Information Centre, the Heritage Centre here in Sudbury. And each of these red posts is about three and a half feet in, in, uh, in height. And this one depicts the uh, the town goal, actually standing in Goal Lane outside the, uh, the Heritage Centre. And there's a little note in the booklet which says behind Sudbury Town Hall is Goal Lane, an impressive Victorian doorway that forms the entrance to the Tourist Information Office and Heritage Centre. Originally this was the gateway to Sudbury Court. Prisoners were locked up in the goal below to await trial. And right at the top of the, uh, the red plaque there's a little bronze statue of a man in prison. There we go. So that's number one on the Talbot Trail. Let's walk down Goal Lane and try and find number two. So the second red pole on the Talbot Trail is outside the Town Hall and that was designed in 1826 by Thomas Ginn. He was the mayor of uh, Sudbury at the time and it opened for, the, to, for use in 1828. And just outside is the second red pole and it depicts 101 Dalmatians. So what's the connection to Sudbury? Well the drinking fountain and horse trough just by the side of um, St Peter's Church just behind me just see that. Um, this was the site where Pongo and Petita stopped for water while searching for their lost puppies in the film 101 Dalmatians and it was a children's book by Dodie Smith and at the top of the uh, red pole here there's a little bronze statue of Pongo, the second of the statues here on the Talbot Trail. walk down from St Peter's Church and by the side of the road is the third red pole on the Talbot Trail. Now this one depicts Boudicca on the top. She was queen of the Iceni tribe in around about AD 44 and it's thought that she came through the Sudbury area to meet up with the Trinovantes tribe who were a very prominent, a very large tribe in the South Essex area. 
and it's here they rallied their support and attacked Colchester, or Roman Cumaludinum, as it was known in those days, raising it to the ground, later moving on to Londinium and Verulamium, and doing exactly the same there. But there we are, that's the third, third red pole on the Talbot Trail. This is quite fun, this Talbot Trail. I'm learning quite a bit about the history of Sudbury and uh, walking around the town on a very sunny and very warm March morning. Now let's walk up into the Market Square and locate number four on the Talbot Trail. Laid on the market. I do love markets. I've had a fabulous uh, stall selling fudge. Another selling tasty pizza. Pizza on the green. Did have a slice. Absolutely delicious. Recommend pizza on the green and the fudge man. I do love fudge. But just down here, opposite the pub, the lady Elizabeth is the, the next red bollard in our uh, Talbot Trail, number four. And this is the Rotten Borough. Mm, someone's been rotten, they've taken the statue off the top. But there's a little photocopy on the, um, on the post. Yeah. So I'll put that on the screen for you to we'll see. But the Rotten Borough. Now, Charles Dickens wrote the Pickwick Papers back in 1836. Mm, and the Edenswill setting of the Rotten Borough, depicted in the Pickwick Papers, is said to be modelled on Sudbury. Uh, and in one election, a wealthy parliamentarian candidate is said to have spent £10,000 bribing voters, who said corruption is uh, rife in politics. Looks like it goes back a long way. It doesn't say it was a Conservative or a would have been a Whig probably in those days, wasn't it? A Whig candidate bribing voters, but yeah, don't get me started on politics. But uh, very interesting to see that little little bollard there, minus its statue. Hopefully they'll replace that in due course and um, put it back so other people can actually enjoy it rather than enjoying a little photocopy. left the market square walking down Gainsborough Street. It's called Gainsborough Street because the, uh, the artist Thomas Gainsborough used to live in Sudbury and his house is just ahead of me. But what I've come to see is the next red post and it's called the Running Boy. Now in April 1879 a boy called James Bigmore decided to run along the side of the Norwich coach, a distance of 60 miles, all the way from Sudbury to Norwich. And he did it in about six hours. I have to remember that coaches in those days were horse-drawn, so it didn't, don't, didn't, they don't, didn't travel as fast as a modern-day coach. But there we go, that's number, number, number five on the Talbot Trail, the running boy. And just around the corner, is number six. <coughs> Top of Friar Street here is another red post. This is um, number six. And on the top is a little statue of Blondin. Now, he was the, uh, the, the high wire artist. And he came to Sudbury in 1872. There was a wire suspended across the road between the, the back of the, uh, the Anchor pub on the other side of the road, and he pushed somebody across in a wheelbarrow. Something different, I suppose, to, uh, to wow the crowds. Also just here is, um, well, it's the Oxfam shop today, but there's a massive fire here back in 2015. 
caused a lot of damage and at one point it was in danger of spreading to nearby shops but uh, the local fire service did a great job and put the fire out and just down from that is, uh, is the anchor it used to be called the White Heart and there's a story there about um, a man called Dr Roland Taylor he was the vicar of Hadley just a few miles up the road and he spent his last, last night uh, there before being burnt at the stake up at Aldham Common on the 9th of February 1555. A large number of people were burnt at the stake for their beliefs uh, in the years around 1555. But what's strange about his execution is his family came to watch. Yeah, I can't work that one out either. Why would you want to come and watch your, your husband or your father be burnt at the stake? I guess we'll never know the answers of that one, but that's what happened. They watched him burn to death. Very strange. But now let's walk down a little further down Friar Street and to the next uh, little red post here on the Talbot Trail. And just a little way down Friar Street on the left is a property and a blue plaque on the outside. Thomas and Margaret Gainsborough lived here 1749 to 1752. And that's number seven on the Talbot Trail. There's a little red uh, pole there with a little statue on the front of Thomas and Margaret Gainsborough. And it says on the leaflet that Sudbury is the birthplace of Thomas Gainsborough. He bought a house with his new wife Margaret at 31A, that's the house I'm standing outside, on Friar Street. And here his daughters were born and he painted many portraits of them before moving to London. Number seven on the Talbot Trail. Now we head down that, down this, uh, this alleyway and try and find number eight. This is where the trail gets a little bit tricky because I've never been down here before. And it goes down across the meadows and the river, probably where I get lost. But we'll see what happens as I try and find number eight on the Talbot Trail. I got a bit lost. I had to ask directions. So I'm hoping I'm on the right path, walking down this little oh, country path, back end of this, uh, this housing estate. It's turning into an absolutely glorious day. Birds are singing in the trees. I hope the camera's picking that up. Must be about 20 degrees today. It's about the same yesterday. It's quite unusual to have uh, warm weather in the middle of March. We did last year. I remember around the same sort of time going out and making a few videos around Colchester. Um, I spent about three days, four days. I was furloughed at the time, so I had the time to do it. But now I'm back to work. I have to make the most of my days off and enjoy the sunshine while I can. And what a great way to enjoy the sunshine. By walking uh, through these country paths. And I'm pretty convinced now that I'm down by the river I'm pretty convinced now that I'm actually on the wrong side of the river. So, uh, but I think I need to be here at some point. So I'm gonna retrace my steps a little bit. And, uh, and try and find, <laughs> try and find number eight on the Torwick Trail. Trust me to get lost. I'm always getting lost in my videos. <laughs> this, is, this is silly. <laughs> I 
found another little pathway. This takes me down to the bottom of Key Lane. And I think this is where the Key Theatre, I can see the Key Theatre just ahead of me. I think this is where I need to be. I'm pretty sure I need to cross over the river again in order to get up towards number nine. Let's just see where I see where I am. Well, it looks like I found number eight directly outside the key theatre. Oh, and someone's pinched the statue at the top. Oh, that's lovely. Another rotten person in Sudbury. He's pinched the statue, that's not very good. But it's next, it, it mentions river transport, this one. And it says in the notes, access to the North Sea and London by boat allowed Sudbury's industries to thrive. Clay in the region produced bricks that were much sought after. Bricks one of the number of products sent by barge to London from the quay here in Key Lane. Oh, it's interesting. It's lovely down here. Like most parts of the back streets of Sudbury, absolutely delightful, especially on a warm, sunny day. Now let's head up and try and find number nine on the Talbot Trail. having a walk around the uh, the river there behind the theatre absolutely lovely talking to a lovely couple who uh, just finished their canoeing what a fantastic day for canoeing on the river a lovely couple to talk to as well but Sudbury's uh, throwing up so many surprises you know, you're walking around the town, walking around these little back streets. It really is absolutely delightful here. I know I've said that already, but it really is. One of the, uh, one of the great towns, market towns of England, largely uh, off the main tourist trail. Perhaps that's a good thing as well. The town of Sudbury is, uh, town of Sudbury is, um, is twinned with Hoxter in Germany and Clermont in France and Fredensborg in Denmark. So I'm wondering whether walking around those towns would be equally as enjoyable as it is walking around Sudbury. Maybe one day I'll, uh, I'll find out. It would be nice to, uh, to visit those twinned towns. Just down the end of Friar Street is number nine, and it's called Dancing Bears. And the note in the booklet reads, bears were brought to Sudbury by Victorian showmen to entertain the local population. You see it there. The muzzle bears were taken down the passage beside 54 Church Street, just around the uh, just opposite, where the showman lodged in cheap accommodation. There we go. Number nine on the Talbot Trail. And behind what used to be cheap accommodation. Certainly isn't now these, these days. What with uh, house prices rising cost of living rising as well. Wondering where it will end. But things were different in Victorian times. Relative to income, I suppose. But just ahead is All Saints Church. Building looking quite magnificent in the morning sunshine. It's been a church here since the 14th century, or well, the current building dates around the 14th century. But there was an earlier church on the site and uh, one of the box tombs on the left is that of the Gainsborough family. 
Uh, Thomas Gainsborough himself is not buried here. He's buried at St Anne's Church in Kew. That's where he lived in his uh, latter years. The impressive building on the right is the Vicarage. Don't know if it's still the Vicarage, but it's a rather splendid building. And on the side is a, is a blue plaque. Now that plaque is to a former vicar here. He was vicar, a man called Samuel Crossman. He was vicar from 1647 to 1665. And he's the musical vicar. He wrote a fantastic hymn. It's the hymn, um, My Song is Love Unknown. Absolutely beautiful hymn. It's one of my favorites. Played it many times on the church organ for services. Absolutely love that tune and he wrote it it's absolutely brilliant samuel crossman it's crossed over the road towards the ballingdon bridge and number 10 on the talbot trail and it's just here next to the boathouse bar and grill there we go and this one's to a lady called Amika. And, the, no, and the, the note says, Amika, the daughter of the Earl of Gloucester in the 12th century, married into the powerful de Clare family and brought her wealth to Sudbury. She founded a hospital by the Ballingdon Bridge, which is just behind me. And it's thought that uh, a new bridge constructed from stone brought in from Northern France. Now there used to be a ford here back in the uh, 13th century. And the first bridge was um, since the 13th century, built over the river where the ford used to be. And there's a blue plaque just ahead of me. Oh, wow, that's exciting. There's a blue plaque on the wall just ahead of me. And it says that uh, the site of the hospital founded by Amica, the Countess of Clare, circa 1200. I do love blue plaques. And interesting that um, the bridge has been there since the 13th century. Well, obviously not that one, that's fairly modern. But it's been a stone bridge there since the 13th century. But it's lovely to see the history of, um, of Sudbury brought to life in blue plaques and this really exciting Talbot Trail. Now let's head on and find number 11 and see what that tells us about the history of Sudbury. This narrow alley is called Noah's Ark Lane. And apparently, when the lane was first, first used, it got its name because you could just fit two cows abreast walking down this lane. And as the Bible story tells us, the animals went in two by two. This little lane seems to have adopted the name of Noah's Ark Lane. Whether that's true or not, or just a lovely little story, I don't know. We'll go through this little sty here, the gate. There we go. It's not a sty, it's a gate into the field. And what a glorious view! Looking across the meadow, absolutely fantastic. And somewhere up here is the water mill. Hopefully I might get a drink because it's... Uh, I've been on the go for a few hours and uh, I think I need to stop for a little bit of refreshment. So hopefully I'll get a drink there. And... Uh, which is where number 11 is on the Talbot Trail. This is absolutely delightful. It's the first time I've walked down here. I've been to Sudbury a few times, but I've never, I've never, I've never actually ventured away from the, uh, the high street or the market area or uh, St. Gregory's Church. I've been there for services for a few, a few times. Beautiful, beautiful old church. We'll, we'll go past that uh, a bit later on this walk. But it's absolutely, uh, absolutely superb. Just a 
just to walk around, get away from the traffic as well. The noise of the lorries going up and down the roads. <laughs> you don't really realise how noisy they are until you actually stand next to them and they go past you. It's, uh, yeah, very noisy indeed. Especially when you're trying to uh, talk to camera. It's very, uh, very difficult to do that with the noise of the lorries. But what a beautiful spring day. Absolutely glorious weather. There's not a cloud in the sky. And the scenery over my shoulder. really is absolutely delightful. And just ahead is the Mill Hotel, which is my uh, next stop on this Talbot Trail. And I must say, it does look rather inviting from a distance. Just up here, opposite the water mill, is uh, it's number 11. And someone's pinched the statue off the top. Oh, delightful. Why do people do that? It really is not. It serves no purpose, it really doesn't. But anyway, this one's, there's a, at least there's a photocopy anyway of what it, what it actually looked like. So uh, I'll put that on the screen. But this one's called the Common Lands. And the famous water meadows that nuzzle up to the town have been grazed continuously for a thousand years. In 1260, Richard de Clare gave the pastures to the burgesses of the town for a rent of 40 shillings a year. I wonder how much that is in today's money. But just walking around here, it's absolutely delightful. And uh, I think a spot of lunch is probably on order right now. So let's, uh, let's go into the hotel and uh, have a spot of lunch and a cold drink because I'm a little bit parched. <laughs> it's been a mill here for over a thousand years. First mentioned in the Doomsday Survey of 1086. And inside is a, is a water wheel, weighs 15 tonnes. And it's quite impressive to, uh, to watch it go round and round. I got a very delicious lunch here. Nice plate of fish and chips. It looks absolutely delicious. And it tastes delicious as well. And it tastes even better because this has been sponsored. So thank you to uh, Roy Tolhurst and Sean Kelly, who both went onto the buy me a coffee link, which you'll find in the description below and purchased a coffee for me. In fact, they purchased several. And uh, it was enough to buy this very delicious lunch and that slice of pizza, earlier, which I had earlier in the market stall. Absolutely delicious that was as well. So thank you so much to uh, Sean and to Roy. And lovely, lovely to meet you as well the other week. Absolute pleasure to meet you. And if you'd like to have a, buy me a coffee and get a mention on the, my, one of my videos, then please do as Sean did and as Roy did and go use the buy me a coffee link which you'll find in the description and you too can get a, a mention on my channel and I'll enjoy a, a lunch or a coffee or whatever is uh, on offer from wherever I am at that moment. So um, I'm going to enjoy my lunch and then we'll continue on the Talbot Trail and find the last three out of the 14. So, uh, more exciting, exciting history to come. But first, I'm going to finish my lunch. Wow, that lunch was absolutely delicious. Big, thick, chunky chips and minted peas and a delightful bit of battered fish. That really was very, very tasty indeed. 
So thank you to Roy and to Sean. But now the trail takes me up by the side of the river, leaving the water mill behind. As I was walking out of the hotel, I found a little plaque on the wall and underneath was the, uh, the mummified remains of a cat. And the, uh, the plaque read that it was an old East Anglian custom to bury a live cat under the construction of the building. And they did that just that about 300 years ago when that building was, the current building was, uh, was constructed. And they found it during excavations back in 1975. And you can actually see the mummified remains of this cat built into the floor. I don't like to see cats like that. Cats should be cuddled up next to me, purring and sleeping. But I guess it probably did when it was alive. But strange customs they had in those days. It was designed to uh, ward off witches and warlocks and protect the building from fire. I guess as the building is still uh, still standing, they, uh, they did just that. So maybe there's something in these old, these old remedies, these old quaint customs, but just feel sorry for the cat really. Rather nice seeing those swans there on the other uh, water, especially on a sunny day like today. But just up here is uh, St Gregory's Church and number 12 on the Talbot Trail. And just at the top of the road is the next red pole, number 12, and it's entitled The Peasants' Revolt. This refers to Simon Theobald, Archbishop of Canterbury, and the poll tax. And the note in the booklet reads, as Chancellor, it was Simon's job to support the King and raise funds for his war on France. He made every person over the age of 15 pay a poll tax, something the poor bitterly resented. Remember Mrs Thatcher's government back in the 1980s reintroduced a poll tax and everybody hated that as well. It didn't last too long. And Simon, well, in 1381, at the height of the Peasants' Revolt, he was dragged out of the Tower of London and beheaded. By June 1381, the Peasants' Revolt was reaching its climatic final stages. The people of England were not happy about the new poll tax, which had been introduced by the then Chancellor Simon Theobald. As well as being made Chancellor in 1380, he was already the Archbishop of Canterbury, having taken up that post five years earlier. On the 14th of June 1381, an angry mob reached the Tower of London, determined to get Simon. The tower was designed to keep any attackers out, but on that day they were let in. Simon was at prayer inside St John's Chapel, inside the White Tower. The angry mob stormed the tower and dragged Simon out onto Tower Hill, where he was beheaded by eight strokes of the axe. His body was taken to Canterbury for burial, but his head was spiked on London Bridge for all to see. A passerby recognised him and took it back to Sudbury, where it remains today inside St Gregory's Church. Number 13 also mentions Simon of Sudbury and it's entitled Simon of Sudbury. And the note in the booklet reads, 
Simon Theobald achieved fame by becoming Archbishop of Canterbury and Chancellor of the Exchequer. He used his wealth to establish a college for priests in Sudbury at the end of the 14th century. All that remains is the gate to the college, standing in St Gregory's churchyard. And in St Gregory's is the church just behind me. So let's uh, walk into the churchyard and have a look and see if we can find the gate that remain, what remains of the, uh, of the, uh, the college gate. But it's a beautiful church, this one. Simon's uh, parents are actually buried in the church. Now oh, the chancel area is all that remains of the, uh, the chapel that once uh, was attached to the college. So Simon probably prayed in the church here, or well, certainly in the chancel. But just ahead is the, uh, is the gatehouse. And there's a blue plaque on the outside it states that the gate of the, of the college, founded by Bishop Simon of Sudbury, 1374. And that's quite an impressive, uh, impressive gatehouse. And it's a great shame that nothing more has survived. And that's history for you, I suppose. We should be grateful that we've got this little reminder to, uh, to Simon and the priest college that he founded. Now let's head on and find the last, number 14, in the Talbot Trail. <coughs> I've just walked up from uh, St Gregory's Church, up New Street, to the top of Gainsborough Road. And just ahead of me is the Masonic Hall, signed and built in 1886 by Frederick Jennings and just behind me is the last of our red poles on the Talbot Trail and this one's entitled Kemp's Jig and according to the story a man called William Kemp who famously danced from London to Norwich in 1599 he found a partner to dance with in, a, in, in that of a, a Sudbury milkmaid and they danced together as far as Long Melford. It's about two miles up the road. I guess he danced all night and all day and up to Norwich alone. Why did she only go to Long Melford, I wonder? I guess he wasn't a very good dancer. I don't know the reason. I don't know the reason, but it's a good story. But this is where I end my Talbot Trail outside the Masonic Hall. I've had a fantastic time walking around Sudbury in the sunshine. It's taken about four hours. I just had an amble around. Some of them I had to find. And other locations, I just admired the scenery. And if you want to do a Talbot Trail, you can download it off, off of the, uh, the council website, or you can call into the um, tourist information centre and pick up a leaflet as I did and have a walk around. It's absolutely brilliant. And on a day like today, well, just the perfect weather for an amble around Sudbury. But thank you to, uh, to Roy and to Sean for sponsoring lunch and thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to leave a comment and tell me that you've seen it and tell me what you enjoyed about Sudbury. And hopefully I'll find some more trails in other towns and bring them to you as well. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again soon for another video from somewhere else.